Is everyone feeling full? Full of food? Good. I will fill you full of knowledge. Knowledge of WebAssembly. So uh, this talk is called WebAssembly, Birth of a Virtual ISA. Um, but I don't really like this name, actually. So I came up with some other ones. This one, maybe we be assembling. Get it? We web OK. Moving on, uh, the right to peaceably assemble. Any uh, First Amendment, United States First Amendment? OK. Simply assembling. I like it. It's a lot of S's. No? Make web assembly. OK, no. <laughs> on Mars. OK, we'll go with on Mars. <laughs> web assembly on Mars. So uh, some things that I've worked on. Uh, I worked on a number of games for the Nintendo. Uh, Incredibles 2, no, there was not a movie, it was just a game. Cars, Ratatouille, Boom Blocks, really fun game. Uh, I worked on Overwatch before it was Overwatch. Yeah, it's, I'm that much of a hipster. Thank you, thank you, okay. Uh, at Google, I work on Chrome. Uh, I also work on Native Client, uh, which you may have may not heard of. And uh, now I work on WebAssembly. Um, I also do some, I sort of help out a little on V8. Okay, so what is WebAssembly? This is what you all want to know. And I've actually, I've spoken to a number of the speakers, and people ask a lot of questions. They're like, well, what, is it going to do this? Is it going to do that? Okay, well, I'll just, let me tell you what it is. So it's a new text in binary format spec. Okay, that doesn't mean a lot. So it's designed to be fast to load and execute. So it's an alternative to JavaScript. Um, the idea is it's a compilation target, uh, not a programming language. So you would take, use something like C or C++ or Rust, uh, statically typed languages, and you compile to WebAssembly, and then you'd run that inside the browser. Uh, so here are the last three points uh, I really, really like. These are the most important in my mind. Uh, safe. So safe meaning you aren't going to be worried about um, crashing the browser. It's not going to happen. It's the same as JavaScript. You're, it's going to be safe. Uh, portable, again, extremely important. It will run on any browser. This is the idea, you know, running on your ARM, your ARM64. Do you have MIPS devices? Any, any MIPS devices out here? OK. Well, it would run on that, too. Um, and this last point is incredibly exciting to me. Many, many people have tried to solve this problem, how to run native code on the web. And they've come up with an, any number of technologies, and they're almost never supported by all the browsers. And I know because I worked on native client, and, and that was one of the biggest issues. WebAssembly, from the start, we have been working with all the major browser vendors. So we have uh, Mozilla, Edge, Chrome, and Safari on board. Um, and very, very excited uh, about that. So um, this is the point that I like to make about WebAssembly. It's the shortcut to the JavaScript engine's optimizer. So your JavaScript engine already does optimize a lot of code for you. That's why it runs so fast. But there are issues. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, who knows exactly how JavaScript optimization works? You probably have sort of a fuzzy notion, uh, but maybe you haven't delved into the source code of SpiderMonkey or V8 or Chakra. Well, OK, so apologies to any of the JavaScript engine developers here, but I'm, I'm going to sort of gloss over, I mean, I'm going to describe it a little bit. So it's tiered. The idea is that there are multiple levels uh, of optimization. You, you initially don't have uh, the code running at full speed because you don't need it, right? Um, hotter code is the code that you need to have optimized. And so what the JavaScript engine will do is it'll start to run your code, right? And then it looks at the types flowing through the system, and it says, OK, this looks like an int. And then if it's confident that's in an int, then it will say, OK, I'm going to recompile this assuming that it's an int. It doesn't know that the next time you call it, you, you could pass in an object or whatever, right? If it makes a wrong assumption, it de-optimizes, and then you go back to the slow version of the code. I assume everybody kind of has a, an idea about how this works. So WebAssembly is basically just shortcutting that, right? Why try and figure out what the types are? Why not just say, hey, here's my types, you know? So OK, that's a, that's a sort of brief uh, explanation of what WebAssembly is. Compilation target, shortcut to your JavaScript engine's optimizer. What is WebAssembly not? It is not a replacement for JavaScript. 
A lot of people think this. They think, oh, well, you're just gonna take my JavaScript and make it run faster, right? No, no, that's, that's not what it is. Your JavaScript engine is already an extremely fast JavaScript runner, right? Execution engine. Converting it to WebAssembly and then running it is not gonna make it any faster. It would make it slower. And there's issues with garbage collection as well. So that's not the, that's not the purpose. It's also not a compilation target for languages that compile to JavaScript. So this one's a little bit fuzzy, because there are languages that maybe could work, right? But if your language relies on certain aspects of JavaScript, uh, let's say um, the object model or, uh, or things like that, WebAssembly is maybe not going to map uh, perfectly, right? If your language is uh, statically typed, and in the future, when we have garbage collection in WebAssembly, uh, you, you can maybe compile WebAssembly to, or compile your language to WebAssembly in that case. But for now, just think, probably not, probably not. And the last point I want to make here is not a programming language. It's a compilation target. Now, some people might disagree with me here, because you, know, you can compile assembly. You can, you can write assembly. Anyone written assembly? OK. It's, it's not fun. Y you can do it, but the primary use case we're talking about here is taking, something, taking code like C, C++, Rust, D, that kind of thing, and compiling them. OK, so why WebAssembly? Oh, there's a whole big list of things here. Um, I'll let you read them. I, I won't read them out to you. Um, but the important thing to think here is um, if you have code that is CPU bound, right? If you have code where you're doing a lot of computation, right? If you're doing uh, uh, code like, say, uh, so some things that you might see here, like uh, encryption, that's something that actually might work very well uh, for WebAssembly. Compression, um, platform simulation, uh, that's one that I like quite a bit. Uh, VR and low latency, that's actually a very uh, interesting point to make because. Uh, for VR, you probably, and actually the, the next speaker will talk about this more, and hopefully he agrees, um, it's important to be able to run extremely fast, right? Faster than 60 frames per second, if you can. Um, do you want GC pauses? Probably not, right? So um, being able to have a consistent performance, which is what uh, WebAssembly gives, that's very important. Um, video augmentation. Uh, being able to manipulate audio and video, all, all very important things. Uh, and so the link here is, is to the WebAssembly GitHub page, and you can read all about that stuff when I uh, give you the slides. OK, so a demo. This is a, <laughs> this is a Game Boy emulator that I wrote uh, native code for. Um, I, I did it in my spare time. And um, I actually compiled, the, uh, compiled this to WebAssembly yeah, this, do you remember this game? Anybody? Um, I thought for, with the 80s theme, this is in 1989, you can see that there. Um, I compiled this into WebAssembly, actually, in my hotel. Um, I, I never tried it before, and I was just like, oh, OK, let's, let's give it a shot. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so you might say, OK, well, we could have already done that with, with JavaScript. Um, why, why do we care? Well, so here's the thing. When you're running code that is CPU bound, like an emulator often is, there's, there's, there's two points to consider. There's the one issue of uh, how, how much CPU you use, right? But there's also how much battery you use. And so using less CPU is using less battery. So especially in a mobile device, that's very important, right? We want to be sure that we're not sucking up, you know, I mean, your phones don't last very long as it is. I know mine doesn't. Uh, isn't it better to say, let's use less of that and give people the same amount of power? OK, so now let's go with some technical deep dives. Everyone ready for this? <laughs> I know I am. OK, so we have a simple function. You probably were looking at already. This is the Fibonacci function. Um, I wrote it in C because I like C. I know this is a front-end conference, and so maybe that's a, not the right perspective to have, but it's the truth. Um, OK, and in C++. Oh, right, it didn't change. OK. Uh, C++14, yeah, look at that. You see the autos? Pretty cool. Um, OK, so it's a little bit of a joke. But the point I'm trying to make here is actually 
you, we support modern C++. So, uh, OK, maybe auto is not the most modern C++, but anything you can imagine, templates, uh, unique pointer, shared pointer, all that kind of stuff, it's in there. But so this is the example that I want to, I, I want to delve into. So how do we compile it? Um, well, you may have seen this before. This is Imscripten. So Imscripten is a compiler that takes C and C++ and compiles to JavaScript, to Asm.js. But it turns out that that's actually also a useful compiler for compiling to WebAssembly. And so there's actually a function. Uh, it will, will, currently, this is how you do it. It'll be better in the future. But uh, currently, this is how you do it. You compile, and you pass in Binarian, which is the name of the WebAssembly sort of uh, backend for Imscripten. And then you would say the, the functions that you want to export, in this case, underscore fib. And that's the C mangling um, of the name. Uh, right, and so I just talked about those two. OK, so what's happening here? We're compiling C code using Clang via Imscripten. Imscripten generates asm.js. So who's heard of asm.js? OK, yeah, good number of people. Um, Who's used Asm.js? Very few. OK. Well, so Asm.js, uh, it's kind of the history of WebAssembly. It's a low-level optimizable subset of JavaScript. The idea is that you use type annotations on your JavaScript to be able to tell the JavaScript engine, no, 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 this is an int. It's not an object. It's not a number. What's a number? It's an int. I know it's an int. Um, make it an int. Uh, you have linear memory. So the idea is you use an array buffer, which is kind of a weird thing. A lot of people don't use them. Um, but it's extremely useful for, for emulating uh, memory for, uh, for ASM.js. And that's, it, it, it basically represents the C address space. It's done via a, a linear memory array buffer. Um, and you have in, import functions and export functions. And, um, and as I mentioned, you have type annotations. So let's look at how the Fibonacci function is converted into asm.js. So what you can see here is it actually looks very much like uh, the C code. And it actually looks JavaScript-y, right? You know, there's a little bit of weird stuff. But like, there's the module there. And the module is a uh, function that's closing over that, the Fibonacci function there. And then you have the exports at the bottom. You see where it says return fib fib. Um, yeah, so at the very top, you see this use asm. That's the note to the uh, JavaScript engine to say, compile this as asm.js. And then you have these annotations here. So this n equals n or 0. That's one of these JavaScript tricks you probably all know. When you or something with 0, it says, OK, make it an integer. If it was a float, make it an integer, right? So this annotation lets you run asm.js as basically um, as JavaScript. Right? And so you can see a plus b or a 0. It's the same sort of thing there. It's doing an annotation that says, make this an integer. Um, OK. So wow, asm.js, it's, it runs fast, right? You've probably seen it run in Firefox. Um, and, it, and it's actually pretty good speed. Um, why not just use asm.js? Like I said, it's uh, asm.js where engines can actually make it run quite fast. Um, and it's just JavaScript, right? This is the quote that people say. When you run it, if you run it in an engine that doesn't support ASM.js, it, it actually runs just like JavaScript does, because all the type annotations are what JavaScript already would do, right? But there's a number of problems. Um, parsing can be very expensive. So when you take a giant blob of C code and you compile it, you can end up with ASM.js modules that are megabytes large. Right? And you have to use your JavaScript engine to parse that. It's very, very slow. Um, or it can be. Uh, validation failure. So this is another issue. When you fail validation, because all those annotations are required by asm.js, as soon as you get to the point of failing validation, it has to say, oh, actually, you probably wanted this to be JavaScript. And it has to run as JavaScript. And, th and the issue with that is it means it's hard to extend functionality. So now, imagine that we want to add shared memory. OK, I know, kind of a dirty word, but imagine you wanted to do that. Well, how do you do that, right? Now you have to add shared memory to JavaScript to be able to support it in ASM.js, even though ostensibly they should be separate things, right? Uh, and this last one is a big one for me. There's no 64-bit integers, right? I mean, it's crazy. We're, I mean, we're all running 64-bit phones, and we can't do 64-bit integers? OK, so. Um, 
Maybe we can do better. OK, so we're going to take our ASM.js, and we're going to do the next step. What is the next step? We're going to convert it to the WebAssembly text format. So you look at this, and if you're a Clojure fan, you probably go, oh, wow, that looks like Lisp. Wow, cool. It's kind of like Lisp, but there's a reason for that. The reason we have it look like this is because originally it was just an AST. It was just an abstract, abstract syntax tree representation of the, uh, the structure of your program. So uh, the reason that we like that is that it's e very easy to parse. It's very easy to manipulate, right? And so you can see that here. It's very verbose, but it's, you know, it's not too, uh, too hard to, to, to read. So uh, what we have here is these two locals, right, A and B, and um, they, by default, are set to zero because we don't want non-determinism. And then we have set local, and we say set local B, I32 const one. You'd never want to write that, but that's how it, it's represented so that you can very easily parse it and say this is an int, right? OK, so now we have a loop. Um, this is equivalent to uh, what I have on the side here. It's kind of like a do while zero. Now, that seems weird, right? Because that's not a loop. That's nothing if you fall through the bottom of it, right? The reason why it's represented that way is because a loop in WebAssembly is really just a label that is the top. You're just saying, if you ever do a branch, branch to the top, OK? And um, so you can see that here. We have exit and next. Exit is branching to the end. Next is branching to the top. You can think of it as break and continue, right? And so we have this uh, statement here, br if. br if stands for branch if, right? It's a very common uh, thing to want to be able to generate if you're generating code. So in this case, it's equivalent to something like if n is less than or equal to 0, break. And so what you see here is this LES. That stands for less, to, less than or equal to signed. So it's doing a signed integer comparison, right? OK, so now we have a little bit of a tricky one here. This is set local, i32 add, get local, t local, get local. Did everyone get that? So what's happening here is we're actually doing a bit of a trick. Uh, t local is, is an operation that can take a value store it, and then return that value as an expression. And that's what C will do for you as well, but we do it in a, in a safe way. Uh, if you know C, you know that there's an issue with sequence points, right? And if you do an operation like that and you modify a value and then you use it elsewhere, it'll be illegal. But in WebAssembly, it's not the case because we have a strict evaluation order that's required. It must evaluate all of its operands from left to right. OK. So then this is n equals n minus 1. And this is returning the final value. Cool. But I kind of lied, because really what uh, WebAssembly is is a stack machine. So now if we have any fourth fans here, they might be happy. No? Oh, there's one. Hello. OK, so what actually is happening here is we convert our function from preorder, which is uh, a pre-order representation, which is what I was showing before, into more of like a stack machine. And so now we can do the fun thing that you've seen maybe in your CS classes. Let's just run through it a little bit. I, I won't do the whole thing, but let's, let's just step through a bit so we can understand it. So we have this i32 const one. We push that onto our stack. We do a set local. OK, that sets our value. We do a get local. We do another get local. Then we do our comparison. You can see what that does is it actually uh, returns a value, right? It, it, uh, it, it pops those two values, and then it pushes back on the result. And then we do our brif that does our comparison. We do some get locals. We do our t local. And so what you see here is that it actually just sets the a, but it leaves the stack the same. Then we do our add. We do our set. Now it pops the value off the stack. So that's the difference between the t and the set. And then we finally do our subtraction. We set our n again, and then we branch back to the top. So you can see. Uh, we iterate through the execution like so, right? And so this isn't just me sort of like yamming up to, to you guys to, uh, to explain uh, stack machines. This is actually potentially a way that your WebAssembly engine would execute, say, when you're debugging, because it's actually very convenient. This is exactly the way that WebAssembly is represented in, um, in the code, in the binary format. So you will actually be, uh, be able to look at what's actually generated and step through in a very nice way like this. OK, so now 
We have our text format. What's the next step? We generate our binary format. This is actually what's going to be loaded by the, by the engines. All right, so who likes reading binary? I know I do. Um, so what we have here is the ASM binary format. We have the header, a type section. This type rep represents a function that's in the, uh, in the binary format. Then we have the function section that represents one, it's, it specifies that there is one function that has a, uh, the previous type. Then we ex uh, represent our exports, right? And then the code section, which has a lot of bytes here. Oh, why not? OK, let's look at it. See? You see? <laughs> Looks good, right? So the, the only point that I want to make here is that you can see this is the, the stack, that, uh, the, the code that I showed you before. And this is actually what it ends up turning into. It's a very little bit of code. Um, very, very fast to parse as well. OK, so now we load it via our, our, uh, our JavaScript API. Uh, and so what you can see here is we've got our, our array buffer, right? And that's going to be our web, WebAssembly module. And you get that you know, maybe via fetch or something like that. And then you compile, and this is a, um, it returns a promise. So then when you get your, your, your value back, that's the compiled module, right? But a compiled module needs to be instantiated. So that's what we're, we're doing here. We say new WebAssembly instance module, and then we pass in a, a, a collection of import functions. Um, I can get into that later if you, if you guys are interested. And so then finally, what we do is we call our Fibonacci function, and that's all we, that's all we have to do. So um, this is one thing that I want to point out to you that I think is very important. Um, the name of the, uh, uh, the top level is uh, WebAssembly. And yeah, that was, that was all me. That was my claim to fame. So if you, if you ever want to know who, uh, who came up with a stu stupidly long name, it's because I suggested, why not just use WebAssembly? They were all suggesting, well, let's call it WASM. No, no. OK, so finally, what does your JavaScript engine do? It takes that binary format, it loads it, and <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this slide. OK, but I'm going st to stick with this slide. So it's actually going to generate code that looks like this. OK, so maybe you don't read x64 assembly for fun. Uh, but but I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of it, because I, 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 this is the stuff that I love. You know, I, this, this is just, ah, oh, it's so great. Like, OK, so look at this. XOR, RDX, RDX. Right? So XOR, this is the XOR trick. A lot of people know this. It, it's a, a way to set uh, a value to 0. Um, OK, and so then so RDX is our A. RBX is our 1, right? So now we do a comparison, and we do a potential branch. Hey, so there's our, there's our if break, right? OK, so now this one's a bit, a bit weird. This is an x64 thing. There's this LEA instruction. It's kind of like a way to do addition. OK, so moving on. And then we have our sub, and then we have a, a swap, basically, that's happening here, right? And then we have our branch back to the top and a return. So look, that, that whole thing turned into this. It's like, it's just, it's just that. It, you, you guys don't, I, I think that's great. <laughs> I, oh man, so exciting. Um, okay, so there's a lot, there's a lot more to mention. I, I'm not gonna go into all of this. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what exactly we're talking about here when we're talking about WebAssembly. We're talking about taking something that's very simple, very low level, and compiling it directly down so that you know you're executing something very quickly on your, on your target architecture. So there's a, like I said, there's a lot more to talk about. There's linear memory, uh, very similar to ASM.js. There's other control flow operators. BR table is kind of like a, a jump, jump table instruction. Um, there's indirect function calls. You can import functions. That would be the way that you would actually access JavaScript. Uh, there's export functions. That's how you basically uh, would expose a function to JavaScript that you can call into. Um, 32 and 64-bit floating point operations with a full suite of, uh, of operations that you might like. Uh, start function, that's sort of like an initialization. So if you know much about the JavaScript module format, it's sort of like having that init initializer function. Um, and global variables, uh, which, I mean, who doesn't like global variables? <laughs> so uh, if you want to know more, or if you want to like follow along, because we do it all the development out in the open, you can go to github.com slash WebAssembly. Um, you probably want to take a look at the design repo or the spec repo or the, spe the repo that I work on, which is called Sexper Wasm Prototype. 
say that three times fast. Thank you very much. Lots of questions from the audience. Great. Uh, this sounds a bit like Java applets. Why is this better? Java applets. Well, so that's interesting because here's a big difference. Java is a plugin, right? This is running directly inside the browser. It's the same JavaScript engine, right? That's a, that's a very important th thing to, to note about this. Also, it shares the same stack. So when you call a function out from JavaScript into WebAssembly, you can call back and forth out, uh, back and forth between Web, uh, WebAssembly and JavaScript, and there's no issues. Now you could do that with JavaScript, but there are, but there are, uh, or sorry, with Java, but I believe that there are, are complications there. Um, and again, it's that's a plugin. It's it's disconnected from the browser. This is integrated. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a couple of niche questions. Okay. Maybe. Will we be able to run some of the Node modules with C, C++ add-ons in the browser with WebAssembly? I, I think that's likely. I mean, I'm not going to speak for what the Node.js developers do, but um, V8 has a WebAssembly backend built into it. So if Node.js decides that they want to, uh, to include WebAssembly, then yes, of course. You could take a module, import it, and then you won't have to write uh, platform-specific or even architecture-specific modules. So I, I think it's quite likely, yeah. Excellent. And, and a similar one, Will, would WebAssembly be useful to run scripting language on the client, e.g. compiling MRI Ruby to WebAssembly? So um, that's a good question. That's something that um, you can do. But there is a question as to whether or not it will, it will give you the benefits that you want, right? So um, for example, compiling Python or Ruby uh, to WebAssembly, what you really would be doing there is you'd be compiling the, uh, the interpreter. Right, the, the Ruby engine or the Python, uh, like C Python to WebAssembly and then running that, which means that it has its own GC disconnected from the JavaScript GC, and there are issues there. So now the future versions of WebAssembly where we do have uh, GC integration, By maybe. GC, you mean garbage collection? Uh, sorry, garbage collection, yeah. Excellent, thank yeah. you. Um, a couple of old guy questions okay. from me, because I'm MC, so I claim MC rights. Do it. What's the backwards compatibility story? I mean, this is lightweight. It's going to go down the wire very fast. It's going to execute very fast. So I can expect lots of people to start delivering traditional websites yeah. this way. What happens if I view it in IE10? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of work we did originally was to make it so that it was polyfillable. And as you saw, it actually is very similar to Asm.js. Asm.js, you can already uh, run, as I said, on, on older JavaScript uh, engines. Um, the issue with WebAssembly is that we, we will like to start diverging from, from JavaScript. And so, yeah, what is the, the, the story there? I think the initial story will be you compile an Asm.js module and a WebAssembly module, right? Um, later, you might have to say, OK, well, certain features we, we can't provide. And, and that's, you know. We have to move forward, right? Indeed. Does WebAssembly run in a VM in the browser? In a VM? Well, I mean, I guess if you want to call it the JavaScript VM. But like I said, it's generating actual assembly uh, code. So it's, it's, it's jitted. Um, yeah, it depends on what you mean by VM. Is it the web if the source code for a page is not human readable? That's a good question. But, but so. This is a problem that already exists, right? People minify their JavaScript, and you could argue that, OK, well, but I can unminify it, and I can read it, right? But it's, I mean, have you tried to read the Google homepage code unminified? It's horrible. I mean, OK, I, okay well, it's, it's hard to read, is all I'm saying. So uh, WebAssembly, I don't think, is going to make anything worse. Like, the, the point is that. It's very important to us that you can actually read this code. And there is a text format, right? There's a one-to-one -one mapping between the binary format and the text format. So what you should be able to do is say, yeah, I can view the source. Here it is. Here's this binary blob. Convert it to text. And now I can step through and I can read everything, right? It's not going to be pretty, but it wasn't pretty in JavaScript either, right? So for people like me, because this will surprise you, but I'm actually 
turned 30. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Only last week. <laughs> For people like me who, ages ago, realized that you could view source in a browser and look through all these weird angle brackets and HTML stuff, mm. actually, then, that HTML was barely readable to me because I didn't know what it was. So what you're saying is this is just a similar problem. You know, nobody's going to be re nobody's able to read WebAssembler without some knowledge, but yeah. one would gain that knowledge just in the same way that you yeah. gain the knowledge of reading CSS and HTML. Yeah, that would be the hope. I mean, again, it's low level, so it's not going to be super easy. But hey, you guys, you guys learned some already. So how hard could it be? Right? So the era of view source and uh, people learning that way is not dead. I, I, think, I think we have a really smart audience and a really smart uh, group of, of front-end developers. And but they I'm, will be able I'm asking and I'm stupid. You're very smart <laughs> as well, Bruce. Yes, every, we're, ver, we're all very smart. And I think we'll be able to, it's, it, it, it'll, it'll, you'll be able to view the source. Aww. Ben Smith. Thanks.